In this episode, I'm joined by marketing consultant and trainer Roz Conkey, where we discuss how businesses can go about understanding their ideal customers and budget-friendly marketing tactics to reach them. Roz, great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Thanks for welcoming me here. Not at all. Well, look, Roz, for everyone listening in, for a bit of background, can you give a bit of an introduction to who you are, um, your interesting career that you've had, and, and what you help your clients to achieve? Yeah, thanks. So um, I've been working in marketing for nearly 20 years, which sounds like a long time, um, but I didn't take a very conventional route into marketing. I did my degree in mechanical engineering, and I, my plan as when I was young was to become an engineer. And um, as a graduate, I started working at an engineering company in a, a robotic company, actually, and as a design engineer. And I, it was a really small company. I was employee number five. And at the time, my, my boss, who was the managing director, said to me, do you know, Ros, I think you'd be good in marketing and sales. And I thought, oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's all creative fluff and nonsense. That sounds like a um, step backwards. Yeah, yeah, I've got an engineering degree. I want to design robots. That's why I'm here. And so, and I, so I, I mean, obviously I didn't say this to my new boss, but, um, as I started working in, I got, started getting involved in marketing and sales. And as I, the more I learned about marketing, the more I realized that, well, bad marketing is fluff and nonsense. We've all seen it, but good marketing is, is actually very structured. It's methodical. It's carefully planned and designed and project managed. It's tested and measured and incrementally improved and all of a sudden it starts to sound a lot like engineering and so my career's kind of come full circle because of the way that I do marketing now is the way that I was taught how to do engineering you know start with a really good specification and then brainstorm how you can meet that specification you know make sure all of your um all of your ideas are, are really aligned with that specification and and then you start small and prototype test measure tweak incrementally improve and then when it's working really well then you scale it up and that's that's how good marketing is and that's so I talk about marketing machine with my clients because it's, it's something you can visualize something that's tangible marketing is so often it seems like this sort of intangible nebulous dark art um whereas I talk about it as like okay well let's let's design a marketing machine that's going to churn out long-term loyal customers so well, you know, how is that? How is that marketing machine going to work? And um, yeah, so that's that's the way I work with my clients and how how I ended up in marketing. And I I really I really love marketing. And I am, I love marketing because the the reason I went into engineering is because I wanted to make stuff that people would buy and use. But you can design the best products in the world or services, and if, but if people don't get it, there's just no point to it. So mm. you've got to get the marketing right. And and the sales so that people understand why this is such a great um, you know, product or service. Yeah, yeah, no, to to totally agree. Um, and and your point about building systems and processes, obviously, that's that's very well aligned to your engineering background. But applying that to marketing is incredibly valuable. When when you're working with clients, first of all, what sort of organisations do you typically work with? Well, we work with quite a lot of engineering companies, tech, as you'd expect. Yeah. But um, we also we also work with quite a few um, creatives, and it, it's funny our, our clients seem to fall into two categories. Either they are very structured people who want someone who's going to do marketing in a very structured way, or they're completely unstructured people who are you know very creative types who know that they need some structure in their business, and need, uh, you know we're the ones that can bring that structure for them. Uh, because they are not themselves necessarily particularly structured or they just they want that structure in their business. So we work with two quite different types of clients, but a lot of engineering tech software, as you'd expect, a lot of niche businesses. Yeah. 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 And, and and the point you made earlier about well, in, in a product background or an engineering background, wanting to create something that people will use and it will improve their lives. Well, it doesn't matter if the communication is not right or the audience isn't right, or even perhaps in the product development, it wasn't spec'd out properly. A key part of that is actually understanding who your customer is. Um, and I know when, when we were speaking before, we were talking about ideal customer profiles. Um, it'd be good to get your thoughts on actually how as, how as a small business you'd go about understanding who your ideal customer should be. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, you start with the specification and your specification, if you're creating a marketing machine to churn out long-term loyal customers, you've really got to know what your raw materials are going into that machine. And that's your ideal customer persona. So who are, who are your dream customers that you want to attract 
to your business because particularly in small businesses, um, especially especially very niche businesses where, um, you know, they can't just look around at what other people are doing in their marketing and go, oh, yeah, we'll just copy that because their businesses are different and what they're selling is is different and they, you can't just copy and paste, you know, you can't just sort of advertise something and people go, oh, yes, I'll have robots or something um or you know huge software system um you you've got to you've got to be you've got to re, you know educate people on what what they're actually buying and so having an ideal customer persona means that you're you're it's the difference between a, a, a skip to gun approach you know trying to target everyone which is a friend of mine calls it uh who's mark said she calls it spray and pray mm. and you know you're just putting your name out there everywhere you can and just crossing your fingers and hoping that it'll work the the alter- the problem with that is that that might work for a big business that has a massive budget and really does need to get in front of everyone you know the you know the types i'm talking about you know the sort of mm. the john lewis marks and spencers go compare these companies that really they just want to get in front of everybody because their services are really for everybody um but for the kind of people that i work with who are like i said often very niche very specific they're looking for specific types of people and it might they don't want to get in front of millions and millions of people they just want to get in front of the right people mm. so to create an ideal customer persona a lot of people um so the way i was taught how to do this um you know back in the day um was to well you start with demographics so what you know how old are they and are they male or female and what do they like to do and where do they live and you know, are they married and have children? All of this sort of demographic kind of stuff. What books do they read? The problem with that now is that, you know, we can, the reason that was useful 20 years ago is because you, you, we had so many, we had much fewer choices when it comes to marketing and, and getting in front of people. Whereas now we can get in front of people in so many different ways. We can be very specific using data-driven marketing to get in front of very specific people using, you know, digital advertising, where you can really be specific about the kind of people you want to get get in front of, the kind of things that they're interested in. So actually, I, I don't start with demographic at all. I start with what, what's really important to your customer. So really get into the mind of your customer and think about those, you know, imagine one customer that you've maybe you've worked with in the past or someone, you know, just some of the, the kind of person who, if you met them at a business networking, you just climb over everyone else to speak to them because they're mm. such a perfect fit for your business. You know, they need what you offer. They've got the budget. They're going to get so much value from it. Their values are aligned. You know, they're really, they're just a great fit for what you do. And when you've got that person in your mind, you can really start thinking about, okay, well, what, what's important to them when in the context of my category of you know my product or service the kind of things that i sell what's in you know what do they like about what i do what do they dislike about it they've never worked with me before so you know what are they what are they going to be concerned about what are they going to be you know what are they going to be worrying about when it when they're thinking about buying from me you know they've never bought they don't know if i'm i could be a complete cowboy for all they know so what what's the worst case scenario if they buy from me and i turn out to be terrible what what's the implications for them and and what questions do they want to ask and these sorts of things once you start to really understand these things about your customer that's where your marketing gold is because that's the content you can create those are the 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 kinds of things you want to put on your website that like the questions that people ask put all of those questions and and your answers on your website so that you can overcome those questions before people even pick up the phone to you and yeah and it just makes your marketing so much more attractive to the right people because then when the person the people who are just like your ideal customer when they go to your website and they see that you've already answered all the questions that are already in their head plus a few more that actually they hadn't thought of yet and it builds so much trust it helps you know it helps that build that relationship they see you as an authority of a trustworthy authority and and it just helps people to buy more easily yeah yeah absolutely thank you and uh ros you, you've shared with me uh, a checklist that's available on your website so i'll include a link to that in the show notes um yeah sure but i i, I think you, you you're absolutely right to mention it's not just about how you target the messaging because we, we've got a wealth of capabilities now not just um with how we can target um 
uh, but our, our ads online, but with connected TV, we can even target, mm. you know, different neighbors in a, in the same street will often get different ads on their TV. And yeah, it's remarkable it's amazing, what can isn't be achieved. It? Yeah. And did you find this with your clients that, you know, you can, you can be, well, depending on what the client wants, but you can get so, so targeted into exactly the right person. Um, like you say, with different digital platforms, it's, um, but you've got to know, you've got to really understand your customer in order to do it, can't you? Because yes. you can't say, you can't do that, use that kind of data-driven marketing effectively if you don't know that your customers are, what, what they're thinking about, what they're interested in, what they're concerned about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, it would be um, great if you could talk about how an organization, how a business can actually go about understanding who their ideal customers should be. Yeah, um, well, and this is a huge difference between big businesses and small businesses. So in the way I was taught how to do marketing, which is pretty much, I think, how big businesses, I think I was taught how to do marketing for big businesses. And I don't know whether you found this with your, you know, when you were trained in marketing, that like the, the structure, it was sort of start with lots of market research, do loads of market research in so that you really understand your customers. And then once you've done loads of market research, then you will um, then create your strategy and then you roll out your strategy for the next year at least maybe five years across your team of experts and agencies and all mm. you know hundreds of people and millions of pounds of budget um now the, the clients that i work with you know if i were to say to them okay let's spend five percent of your marketing budget on on market research they'd probably say to me okay well you know that'll give us a few hundred pounds or a thousand yeah. couple of thousand pounds or something but but realistically, there's there's nothing you know there's nothing that I can find out for that small amount of money that they don't already know because mm. the the difference in a small business is that pretty much every business owner that I work with they know their customers already they speak to them every day and this is the huge difference between a big business because a big business the marketing department don't speak to the customers they might have a meeting every so often with the sales team and and then the sales team might speak to some of the customers, but the, the marketing team is, are just that far removed mm. from their customers. So they have to do this market research to understand the customers. But the small in small businesses, when particularly, I mean, with the exception perhaps of e-commerce, there are some small businesses which don't quite fit this model, but most of the service businesses that I work with, they know their customers because they talk to them every day. And so Actually, what we do is we, we take a lean approach. So this is from my engineering background. I don't know whether you've heard of lean as a mm. process. Um, lots of engineers are, you know, well, most engineers are very familiar with it. And software development is all developed using a lean process, which and it basically means you start with a load of assumptions, but you know what your assumptions are. You're very clear about your assumptions. Then you create a minimum viable product mm. or in my case, or in a marketing case strategy, a minimum viable strategy based on all of our assumptions. And then we test and measure, and we, incre we but we incrementally improve rapidly. And and this is how most software is developed nowadays. And um, and the beauty with doing this in a small business, taking this approach with marketing, is that you can start with all of your assumptions about your ideal customer just out of your your business owner's head, because mm. I mean sometimes it takes a bit of coaching to really kind of draw them out, but most of that knowledge and understanding is actually there. So really I'm getting, getting that down, but just acknowledging these, these are all assumptions. We haven't verified these, but we think that most of this is true. And then based on this, well, we can make some good guesses as to how we should go forward with our strategy, but we'll check and test and mm. measure at every stage. Yeah, rinse and repeat that. And, and it's a virtuous yeah. circle at that point. So, yeah. um, it, and sometimes it's you get some surprises. <laughs> yeah, and it keeps it keeps it interesting, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's absolutely. that. That's where the points of differentiation come from as well, I suppose. Because if everyone's looking at very similar data, there's, I guess, across a competitive uh, a competitive market, there's a real risk that everyone's going to end up sort of identifying the same pain points and the same impacts that they're going to make. But if you can find these little nuggets that no one else has picked up on yet, that can be the point of differentiation. I yeah. I really liked your point that you made around just coming up with some hypotheses first and then testing them as quickly and in a low-cost way, testing as many of them as possible and, and learning in, in that virtuous circle. Yeah. Um, when we spoke before, you gave a great example of, of one way that businesses can do that is to look at Trustpilot reviews. 
for example. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. don't know whether you've got any other ideas on how businesses could try and better understand their ideal customer profile or, or, or the audience and the pain that they're trying to fix. Yeah, I mean, there are some really simple market research techniques that any small business can use. Um, one of our favorites is just simply interviewing customers. Yeah. Um, particularly if you're in a, if you're the kind of business where you don't have or you don't want thousands of customers, but you you know, for, for a lot of service businesses, they might only need you know much smaller numbers of good quality cl uh, customers, and you know, picking a few customers who have been a customer for a long time. And just interviewing them and asking them questions about, you know, what what's the impact that we have made on your business? And when before you started working with us, what were your concerns? And um, if someone like you was looking for services like ours, what might you want to know? What would make you? What would worry you? What might? What would help you trust um, a company like ours? And just asking these sorts of questions. Again, all, you know, all the questions that were in my checklist, basically, mm. that's, um, that you, you know, all the listeners can download is just asking them all these questions can, can really help to verify, um, uh, yeah, your thoughts and your, your assumptions. And, and surprising how, how few interviews you, you need to do to start to get to see some real patterns. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, you can do it in sort of less than 10 interviews. You start to see a real pattern in what people are saying. Yeah, I, I found that often I'll pick up on something that somebody just mentions almost as an offhand comment, or maybe it's something I've observed without asking directly. And then the next five sessions where I'm interviewing or even shadowing people, I find shadowing people really helpful. Yeah, um, yeah it's almost really it, that, it's almost verifying that hypothesis that you've learned from the previous handful of of uh, interviews that you've conducted. Yeah, um, just gonna I'm gonna wax lyrical about something I've done recently as well, which yeah, was mine uh, a, a bit of data from. Uh, one of my clients CRM systems and they don't have an especially complex sales process or an especially complex CRM um, but they follow the spiced framework for selling so it's situation pain impact uh, critical event and decision and then oh, exporting all of that information into chat GPT and just saying right you summarize chat GPT what all, what, what the main pains that our customers are experiencing are and it did the work of probably a marketing exec that would take them a week to do, and it did it in five minutes, and it was absolutely brilliant. Wow, that's really great idea. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found it so so helpful. I'm sure there's many many other opportunities that people can find to to try and use that sort of tool to mine and understand the information that's available to us now. Yeah, and actually, even you know, taking um, I mean, you mentioned Trustpilot reviews. Yeah. Taking taking those as well, and um. You know, put, seeing what ChatGPT can summarize them as. What are the main pain? You know, bearing it, with all of this information, what what are the main um, points of difference? What are the main benefits that people are getting? Those yeah. sorts of things. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Cool. Well, Glad you like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's imagine a scenario. You've worked with a client. You've helped them define who their ideal customer is. Uh, that's going to influence the messaging and perhaps. Uh, the, the channels that they use to go and track these customers down. Taking your kind of logical, scientific, process-driven approach to marketing, how do you actually help your clients to understand what of the entire morass of options available to them they should actually be choosing? Yeah, the, the smorgasbord, as yeah. my clients called it. There's the smorgasbord of marketing. And, and I have to, I mean, that is one of the hardest things about marketing, I think, in, you know, now, now in 2024, is this just the the vast choices that we have available? And it, again, this is another reason why having an ideal customer persona that you really know so well. This is why it's so useful because then you can start to, you know, if your if your ideal customer persona is, you know, I don't know, James, you can say, oh well, okay, well, where would James, you know, what would James think? Does James actually is James on? Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, or Instagram or TikTok, does James read these papers, you know, article or journals where we're thinking of advertising? Does James, what does, what does this person do? Where do they go? What might they be looking for? And you can, then you can start to narrow down, um, to, uh, to some opportunities, but, um, yeah, you you do you do end up with a, a very. It's easy to create a very long marketing wish list, and that's why it's so important to have a very logical 
a method for prioritization, which is again something that I teach all of my clients is um and again from you know my engineering background it's just you can't if you're trying to do what I call gut feel decision making, you'll constantly end up changing your mind and changing your strategy. Yeah. And this is where so many of the clients that I start working with where they're at at that time is, you know, all of their marketing decisions have just been based on, oh, now that that feels like the right, the best thing for us to do right now. But I mean, I don't know about you, but my gut changes its mind all the time. So yeah. <laughs> it's well, and, definitely not reliable. Yeah. and 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 also... <laughs> Sometimes it's additive, whatever action or activity you're undertaking, it's additive. So if you run an ad in a newspaper, not saying that people necessarily should, but if you run a single ad, it's unlikely, mm -hmm. I'd expect, to deliver much of a return on investment. But if oh. you've made the commitment, and I've, I've noticed this in my behavior, I, I'll read the Sunday, Sunday newspapers and I won't recall seeing a single advert in there, but occasionally there'll be an advertiser who they advertise in the same spot, in somewhere prominent, week in, week out for three months. And I yeah. do end up noticing them. But if someone had gone, well, we've run one ad, didn't work for us, let's move on to the next thing, try that for one or two times, that didn't work either, and just move on. Actually, no, nobody ever learns. Oh, you, you must get this too. Oh, yeah, we tried this. We tried Instagram, it didn't work. Yeah, we tried this, we didn't, we, we tried networking, we tried advertising, we tried, we tried all this stuff, we didn't work. it didn't work. Did you, do you get that a lot? Yeah, it's... Um, it's and it's, it's exactly what you said, you know, you, you try these things for a little bit and, but you, you like you say, it, you know, you, you shouldn't expect to see results straight away because it's, as you say, it's additive. Yeah. yeah. And, but, but then the there's time. the, there's the flip side of that same conversation of, well, we've got this super successful competitor who's, and this is how they've grown. And that might be the case, but maybe they did that five years ago and that's now why they're so big and yeah. simply replicating what they were doing at the time. That probably won't work for you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But, it does come down to testing an awful lot, but testing with a bit of bit of intelligence applied to it as well. Um, yeah. For small businesses, in fact, for any business, obviously, you've got to be cognizant of the return on investment of your marketing marketing spend as well. Um, at the smaller end, as we've already discussed, they don't have massive budgets. So their um, channels or their approaches that aren't going to break the bank that they can test and try out relatively easily. Um, I wish there was a simple answer to that question. Yeah. Um, so yes, there are, but again, it depends on what you're selling and who you're selling it to. Mm. Um, and so I mean, like one of the things, it, it depends on, um, so we, we're very careful to look at how much you want to spend per customer. Mm. So the um, question people often ask is about budget and well, how much should I budget? You know, how much should I spend on my marketing? And, and this is kind of, it's a really important question because you've got to get return on investment from your marketing. It's otherwise just, there's no point to it. Mm. Um, and so you have to work out how much you can afford to spend or how much you can, yeah, how, how much money will spending, how much spend on your marketing will give you that return on investment that you need. But that's going to be different for every business because, you know, I've got, I've got a client who, um, yeah, they sell really complicated robotic systems where one, one project might be upwards of a hundred thousand mm. pounds. So, if you if we look at how much can we spend per customer acquiring that customer, we can spend a lot more per customer on for him than for somebody who might sell you know fifty pounds a time of products. And so, I I always start with um, the question of I mean if you if you have a you know your if your accounts are in a good good shape then you can go into your accounts and find out what your profit margins are and so on you can get a much better idea of what your marketing budget should be if you have a good accountant but the way i often start with with a lot of small businesses who don't haven't really thought about this question before is i start with my customer shop so imagine i'm in a customer shop i i, have, I own a customer shop and you can just walk in and buy a customer from me and it'll be an average customer you don't know what kind of customer you're going to get it'll be but on if you buy enough customers from me they will average out to be whatever average you get so if your average customer buys um, or your average customer spend is say a thousand pounds over a few years, then you can you can guess that you know per customer that you buy from me, that'll be how much it'll be worth. So how much would you be prepared to spend buying a new customer? And and it'll be different for every business because it'll depend on your costs and your your profit margins and so on. But 
it's often quite a good place to start because a lot of business owners that I work with, like I said, they're very close to their business. They're very in touch with the, you know, how their business runs. So often they can sort of sit with that kind of thought experiment and go, okay, well, I can, you know, I can probably spend, you know, a hundred pounds per customer or I can spend, you know, I can afford maybe 75 pounds per customer or whatever. But, and then we can start looking at our conversion rates across the, your, your marketing and sales process or your, some people call it a pipeline. I like to call it a buyer journey. So how do people go from never having heard of you before to being a long-term customer? Mm. And when you look at your conversion rates across your, your buyer journey, um, you can start to think about well, how much. So if I can spend, say I can spend £100 per customer, if um, maybe the step before getting a customer might be um, sending a proposal. So let's say, let's just keep things simple. So say 50% of my proposals get accepted as customers. So that means that I can, so if I can spend hundred pounds per customer, then I can spend 50 pounds, half of that, getting someone to a proposal. Mm. And then, and then I can ba go back again and say, so before getting a proposal, people might, let's say, let's say have a first meeting. And let's, again, let's keep things really simple. So let's say we've got a 50% conversion rate between getting a proposal or having a first meeting and getting a proposal. So then if I can spend 50 pounds getting a pro something to a proposal, I can spend 25 pounds getting someone to a first meeting. And mm -hmm. you can, if you measure your, your conversion rates like this all the way through your whole buyer journey, then you can, you, and you know how much you can spend per customer, you can then work out how much you can you know you can track it all the way back to well how much do I want to spend per click and then it gets really exciting because if you're doing if you're doing like some digital advertising for example which is really great really easy to measure you can start going okay well I can spend if I'm spending less than five pounds per click I'm making money I'm spending less if I, as long as I'm spending less than five pounds per click then I'm going to be spending less than a hundred pounds per customer so that's great so then if we start doing some Google ads or some sort of um, digital advertising and it starts, you know, you start getting some numbers in, you start getting some data in and within a month or so you can start seeing what those, what that cost per click is going to be. So if you, if, it, if right from the outset, it's oh, okay, well it's 10 pounds per click and can we, ch can we improve our conversion rates at all? There might be some things that we can do to improve our conversion rates, but actually that we're never going to make that profitable so you can quite quickly discount a marketing activity if you're measuring it right equally you might see okay well actually from the outset it's four pounds per click mm. brilliant i'm making money let's let's scale it up let's you know invest in this because i'm that means i'm definitely spending less than 100 pounds per customer which was my budget we're good yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I i think that's maybe another advantage that smaller businesses have over enterprise size organizations because um you, you're absolutely right to mention that you can measure digital advertising and its performance, et cetera. But it's, I think it's rarely as clear cut um, in terms of attribution for what's actually generating someone's demand. And if you're a massive organization, then you just, you have no option or the C-suite have no option, but to rely on the data that's being fed to them. But I think in many situations, everyone's providing data that means they're doing a brilliant job and yet their revenue <laughs> will be flat or declining. Um, whereas if you're in a small business, you're, the, the leadership's going to be close enough to the front line. They'll know. They'll know that that relationship started off because they met them at a, a, a conference or they, they happened to work with them previously or what, whatever it is. Now, they can apply some intelligence to the data that they're getting from their digital marketing or other, other channels as well. Um, but they've, they've got a much clearer idea as to what is working and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The, the hard um, it, it's complicated by... Um, a long, what I call a longer buyer journey. So for a lot of the yeah. clients that I work with, their business, people don't buy what they sell on a whim. So people don't buy a, you know, 200,000 pound robotic system just on a, on a, on a whim because they see yeah. an advert, you know, they, it's got to fit into their production line and it's, there are lots of people involved in the decision-making process. And there's, you know, it takes, it can take, oh, more than a year to, for that person from when they first hear about this particular product or company to actually having a, you know, getting started, it can take, it can take a few years for some of my customers. And that makes measuring your marketing really complicated because, well, that person, okay, they're a customer now, 
we met them, we've met them at two exhibitions and then we also had a meeting with them and then we bumped into them at another exhibition and then we, yeah. you know, so, so which, and they probably have seen some adverts that we've been running as well. Which of these things have contributed? And the, 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 the answer, unfortunately, is, is kind of all of them mm. because all of them have contributed to building up trust gradually over time. And getting that customer to a point where they trust you enough to say yes yeah. to that big project. Yeah, the white paper they downloaded three years ago yeah. isn't the only reason they've they've become a customer of yours. But without that, they might not have become a customer. Exactly. And but it's impossible. This is why cutting your marketing when people want to try and reduce their marketing budget, which you know at the moment is is on a lot of people's minds, is very difficult because, um, like you say, I mean, you could go, oh well, you know, we haven't had anything from from uh, our social media activity and while you might not have had any direct you might not have had any people clicking on that and then immediately buying but without that regular stream of of content going out and um regular information and just you know touch those touch points mm. over a period of years these customers might will probably not have have become customers and it's yeah it's a really tricky one this one measurement is so important yeah there's um a, a podcaster well he's not a podcaster he's, he he is, runs his own consultancy but he does have a very successful podcast guy called chris walker and something he's been evangelizing is just trying to trying to measure what is causing demand generation in quite a simple way of um all you do is just ask the question at the point of conversion how did you hear about us? And instead of having a drop down menu where everyone just randomly clicks whatever option they first click on without giving it too much thought, it's a it's a required field and it's free text. Right. And you're going to get a ton of junk in there and you're going to get yeah. I don't know, don't none, know. don't know all, all the time. But after a few inquiries, you're starting to get a bit of a signal out, out of the noise. And I've seen it myself with, with some other clients where they're attributing absolutely everything to, oh, brilliant, the website is contributing 100% of our inquiries. But in that same train of thought, before the internet and business was done over the phone, the telephone wasn't generating inquiries. It was just the, the way of communicating. And when you actually look through the data, it's, oh, I found, about you, found out about you on LinkedIn, or I've been following your founder after they gave a talk at a particular conference or whatever it is. But it enables you then to make intelligent investments in the right stuff. Yeah. And the website example is a really great one because actually no one finds a company from the website. They find the company either from a Google yeah. search or from a link somewhere that sent you to the website or no one, unless you're, you know, hotels.com or you're, mm. you know, no one just types in a website thinking, oh, I wonder if this is a website. You, know, you, you, you start with a Google search. Yeah. And so it's, so it's SEO, which is some, how people found out about you or it's AdWords if you were doing AdWords or if it's an advert. And so, yeah, a web where people say, oh, we got all of, or most of our business comes from a website, so we don't need to do all of this other stuff. Yeah, but how how do people find the website? That's that's never the first point of yeah. The, never the first never the awareness driving um, activity. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, yeah. Ros, thank you so much for all of that. I've thoroughly enjoyed our call. Um, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Before I let you go, um, first of all, I love the idea of a customer shop, and if you can actually create a customer shop. That will be brilliant. I think I would be very successful if I could just create a customer shop. At the moment, I'm just doing marketing machines, but um, yeah, customer shop will be awesome. <laughs> but um, something something I am asking everyone uh, for is a book recommendation. And I've been very envious of the collection you've got in the shelf next to you. But um, which book would you like to recommend to all marketeers? Yeah, a, a book which I, I recommend a lot now is called The Jelly Effect by Andy Bounds. Um, it's all about communication and how we can speak to our customers in a way that um, resonates and that, you know, so that, they, like I said before, you know, so that they really get what you're talking about, like so that they hear what you're saying. And they, oh, I get it. Yes, that's what I need. I really, you know, I want to hear more about it. And um, it's a really, really good book, The Jelly Effect. I would I check that out. That it's one. pretty yeah. it's pretty rare that someone makes a recommendation that I've not got somewhere in the house tucked away on a bookshelf behind me or, <laughs> or downstairs. So I will check that one out and add it to the list. Thank you. Um, and afterwards, how can people get in touch with you, Roz? Yeah, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Happy, love to connect with um, people, anyone who's fancy a chat about marketing. Um, my website's rosconkey.com. 
um, the checklist that I mentioned, my customer persona checklist is rosconkey.com slash checklist. Um, and I've got other resources on my website as well, which people can download and use. But I'm Perfect. Sure, yeah, get in touch. I'll make sure to link to all of those in the show notes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.